Well, good evening and welcome to our program. My name is David Brashear and I'm the director of the Muscarelli Museum of Art. I know that many of you can remember almost to the minute what you were doing on the morning of September 11th, 2001. The day is seared into my own memory. We were living in Washington at the time in McLean, Virginia. And I remember arriving to work and my assistant telling me that a plane had crashed into one of the World Trade Center towers. As you know, everything happened quickly. And before long, my wife was advising me to check in with my mother and let her know that I would try to locate my father who was working in the Pentagon that day. And so I parked my car at Roosevelt Island. We really couldn't get any closer to the Pentagon that, that morning. And I walked south along the Potomac River. I never found my father. He did make it home somehow. Um, and he made it home a few hours before I did. But I think we all have our own stories from that day. And in many ways, a conversation about what was done to acknowledge that day in a physical way is the perfect capstone to our Muscarelli Exploration Series this spring, entitled Healing by Design. I wanna thank the Williamsburg Landing for providing support for the series this spring. Our speaker today is the perfect person to discuss the intersection of healing and design. In 2003, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation launched the World Trade Center Site Memorial Competition, which was an international competition to design a memorial at the World Trade Center site to commemorate the lives lost on September 11th. The competition drew 5,200 entries from around the world, and in the end, reflecting absence, designed by Michael Arad and Peter Walker, was chosen as the winning design. Well, Mr. Arad graduated from Dartmouth College, he earned a master's degree in architecture from Georgia Tech's College of Architecture. He began his career at Cohn Peterson Fox, the noted firm. And when he submitted his design to the competition for the World Trade Center Memorial, he was working for the New York City Housing Authority, designing police stations for the New York City Police Department. He's currently an architect with Handel Architects and is involved in a number of interesting projects. And I believe he'll be sharing a few of them with us tonight. We'll have time for questions at the end. And as is our custom, if you have one, please post it in the chat or the Q&A section of Zoom. But I hope you all join me in welcoming now Michael Arad to the Muscarelli Museum. Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, David, for the very kind introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and looking at the lineup, it's a huge honor to, to be the last speaker in the series. So um, without further ado, let me uh, jump right in to the presentation. So as uh, David was telling you his story, um, I had my own story that day as I think all of us did. And uh, I had been living in New York for about three years at that point. And we had a small apartment in the East Village. And uh, my wife, Melanie, was working for a law firm in Lower Manhattan um, and had to leave early that day. So she was already at work a couple of blocks away from the World Trade Center. And I remember hearing, uh, on the news that a plane had struck the World Trade Center and I imagine it was a small plane and it was an accident and sort of um, looked out the window and I could see smoke coming out of the towers and uh, went up to my rooftop to sort of get a better vantage point and was horrified to see the second plane sort of flying south along the Hudson River um, banking around and crashing into the South Tower. Um, and I mean, you know, it's a shocking sight, one that I will never forget. And, and like David, I, I, I tried to, uh, to go find somebody that day. And I rushed downtown and actually found Melanie standing outside her office building. Uh, it had been evacuated, but they were all sort of milling around there. And we, we started walking north and uh, the first tower fell down while we were just a few blocks away from it. And the second one 
by the time we had walked over to the FDR and by the time we got home, the, you know, the skyline of New York was transformed and the city was changed in so many ways. Um, and I do think being in New York and witnessing these events had a, an incredible effect on me. And in many ways, it made me feel like a New Yorker for the first time, even though I'd been living here for three years. Um, and I think that that prompted me on some level uh, to begin to think about a memorial long before a competition was envisioned. And I imagined actually a pair of voids out in the Hudson River, a uh, place where you could walk to the edge of Manhattan and look beyond at the water and see these two voids uh, symbolizing the two towers. Um, and this image sort of persisted in my mind and I ended up um, building a little model, a little using a, a small fountain pump to capture that notion of this sort of flat plane of the river sort of punctured by these two voids with the water cascading into them, but failing to fill them. And I ended up taking a picture of that model against the skyline of the city on the rooftop of my building. And then I sort of set it aside for a while. And I, I came back to it a year later uh, when a competition was held for the design of a memorial at the World Trade Center site. And that competition followed uh, a public process which led to the selection of a master plan that Daniel Liebskin had designed, which took a 16 acre site, a, a super block that was created in the 1970s and 60s when um, 12 city blocks, and you can see it in sort of the top left corner of the image here, of uh, lower Manhattan's urban fabric were essentially raised in a, a, an enormous super block was created and Daniel's master plan called for subdividing that super block, bringing Greenwich Street back through the site running north south, as well as Fulton Street running east west. And I thought that that instinct was the correct instinct to sort of try and weave the site into the city. And the, uh, the 10 million square feet of office space which had um, been demolished, Daniel proposed rebuilding them in a series of five buildings, which would ring the site, but keep that center open. And so you can see here, um, these sort of lighter green marks denoting where the towers had stood um, set uh, as a centerpiece of this development. However, the site itself as uh, the master plan called for it was some 60 feet below the surrounding street level with these enormous buildings bridging over one footprint and cantilevering over the other. And I thought about my own experiences in New York and the days and weeks that followed the event. And in particular, I remember going about two or three nights after the attack, I couldn't sleep and I was out on my bicycle riding around lower Manhattan. Um, everything south of 14th Street had been cordoned off. So there was hardly any traffic. Um, and I found my way to Washington Square Park. And at the center of that park is a fountain. And a dozen people or so were standing around that fountain. There were candles and flowers, but you know, there was no ceremony. There was no, um, nobody leading this congregation, but somehow the moment that I stepped up to the edge of that circle and stood side by side with a stranger, I felt um, supported in a way that changed that bleak outlook um, a little bit to something that that was very meaningful. And I think that public space, Washington Square Park, provided me and it provided, and public spaces throughout the city provided New Yorkers with a, a way for us to stand together. And in doing so, I think uh, we responded differently. I think New York responded with, with compassion and with stoicism. And I think, uh, you know, we build our cities and then they build us to paraphrase Churchill. Um, if we did not have the ability to literally stand side by side, I don't know how we would have reacted. We might've reacted with um, hysteria and fear and xenophobia. And, I, and we did not see that in New York. And so when I looked at this master plan and I saw how it completely disconnected the memorial site from the urban fabric by depressing it 60 feet below street level and hiding some of these areas with these buildings which would bridge over them, I thought it was entirely the wrong direction. Um, 
and so almost as a polemical argument, I proposed something that ignored the competition guidelines entirely and brought this entire plaza up to grade to meet the surrounding streets and sidewalks to weave itself back into the urban fabric of lower Manhattan. And this normative urban plaza would then be punctured by two voids where the towers had once stood. So a plaza demarcated by West Street to the West, Greenwich to the East, VZ to the North and Liberty to the South. And I imagine people standing around those voids, peering down into them, or perhaps standing in a subterranean space, looking through a curtain of water that would cascade down. So it was a way of bringing those voids from the Hudson River to reside at the site. Uh, this was an anonymous competition. Uh, over 5,000 people sent in proposals. And so uh, this is one of probably the last architectural competitions where people still had to actually send in a physical proposal. It was a 30 by 40 inch board. Uh, I remember working on it, printing it and sending it in. And on this board, um, I showed the plaza at grade, the memorial galleries, but what I'd like to draw your attention to, and it's not that visible probably, are the last two, three words in the text that describes the project. And it talks about on their way to work or play. And it was important for me to say that this is a memorial site, but it also had to, to be something that would serve the people who live and work here. Uh, they too would cross the site on a daily basis. And that it wasn't a zero sum game, that something could be both a meaningful memorial, but also an everyday part of, of living in New York. And in fact, bringing those two together would enrich it and make it more meaningful to all involved. So here is that plaza at grade, punctuated by these two voids, surrounded by these uh, structures, which would lead you underground uh, down a gentle ramp to what I described as memorial galleries, where you would look out at the city through this veil of water past the names of the victims, a place where seeing the hundreds and hundreds of names which would surround each pool and um, the roughly acre-sized um, footprint of each tower, um, the enormity of that loss would be conveyed to you. And you could stand there at the, the edge of this space, but not enter it. I was one of eight finalists um, and I got to see the site um, in late 2003 when the recovery effort had already ended um, and everything had kind of stopped and they were waiting for sort of what would happen next. You could already see Tower 7, World Trade Center 7, which was just north of Fulton Street, just outside of the World Trade Center Superblock rising up here. And you could see the old parking levels, you know, yellow, red, and blue that had been below uh, that um, plaza where the towers once rose. You could also see the slurry wall, which was constructed in the 60s to essentially create um, this enormous 16 acre bathtub um, that the World Trade Center would be built in. And there was something incredibly powerful and visceral about this wall, having survived this attack, having held the Hudson River back. Uh, this land had once been in the river and um, its survival became a symbol from the survival of New York in many ways. And I think that's what led Daniel Liebskin to try and preserve it and present it, which is why he was 60 feet below street level. And I thought there's a way to preserve it within the museum structure as it is today, rather than exposed to the air. And I came across the, this uh, cut off steel column that had connected the tower to its foundation. And there was just something powerful and eloquent just about the absence of that steel column, the way it had been torch cut and the recovery effort. And it left a, a mark of what was no longer here. And if you were to put a new steel column here, in some ways you would lose something. You would lose that sense of what had been here and had been lost. Um, as a finalist, I was given uh, about a month to further develop the design and respond to all sorts of questions and comments from the jury and the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation that had overseen the competition. And you can see the beginning of articulation of uh, the choice of trees, of granite, of cobbles, the development of the fountain walls, uh, the descent from light into darkness and towards light as you arrived at the very edge of these memorial galleries and encountered the names of the victims there. 
and the return back up to the plaza transformed by this journey. Um, the jury and the LMDC had a lot of comments. They felt that my depictions of the plaza were very austere as if the space could only be used for memorial purposes. And here I was telling them it would be part of the daily life of the city. And so uh, I added some tall Eastern white pine trees, but they still felt that that was not quite enough and challenged me to, to do more with the landscape, at which point I also reached out to Peter Walker for his help, as well as to uh, a very dear professor at Georgia Tech, Doug Allen, who unfortunately has passed away, who uh, was really my, a source of inspiration to me in many ways throughout my graduate education and thereafter. And so it was great to reach out to Doug. And as I tried to find a way of um, changing the nature of that plaza without overwhelming the clarity of that first gesture of a flat plane and the two voids that are linking it back to that design idea from the, from the memorial that would have been in the Hudson River. And so I came up with this idea that I called the abacus-like bands where trees would be arrayed along these rows, sort of like the beads on the wires of an abacus and they might be close together or far apart, but there was sort of an underlying soft order to them. And as you turned your gaze 90 degrees, that order would disappear and what looked like rows of trees would all of a sudden have a much more sort of naturalistic and haphazard uh, look. Doug said, I think you should turn it 90 degrees so it follows the arc of the sun in the sky, which we did, and returned to the jury with these revised images showing uh, sycamore trees at this point. Um, on a plaza uh, with a paving pattern that really created that sort of grain that runs east-west. And you can see some of the benches here. That was a, a very good bit of advice from my mother-in-law, which I neglected to take to heart early on, which was, it'd be nice to have a place to sit in the shade while you're here. <laughs> and uh, she got what she wanted, which was the right thing. Um, in January of 2004, the design was selected and we went to work on realizing the design in all of its various complexities. Um, um, beginning with, you know, the profound questions of how would we handle uh, the unidentified remains? Uh, over half of the remains that were found um, were never identified. And um, we knew that we would have to store them as advances in DNA technology would provide answers to family members. And one idea was to have a repository for them underneath the North Tower footprint open to the sky. And then at the other end of the spectrum, where would uh, school groups come to? Where would the information desk be? Where would there be bathrooms? And so we created a hall in between the two galleries, which would answer some of those needs. One of the first tasks we took on was the design of the fountain walls and how would they appear like this uh, beautiful example, uh, Paley Park on 53rd Street in Manhattan, where the wall, the water clings to the surface of the wall. The wall is slightly canted. Uh, it's very rough and there's a lot of water involved to create that visual effect that is so beautiful. Or would it be more like this um, water feature at the World Financial Center where the water free falls after going over a serrated weir edge. And we ended up opting for that second idea um, because we thought we, that the water as it splashed into the pool should fall as far away as possible from the people walking in those memorial galleries behind that water feature. Our fountain consultant, Dan User from Toronto, uh, built a full-scale mock-up of a corner of the pool um, in his backyard and we tested it in the winter and in the summer, uh, I tested various serrations. All of this has to be done at full scale because the behavior of water cannot be sort of scaled down uh, and understood. And this process went on for a while and we ended up with this sort of, these weir fingers that separate the water as it comes over the edge of the weir into individual streams. And as they fall some 30 feet, the clarity of each individual stream um, disappears, the, the strands of water are woven together, creating sort of a, 
a tapestry. And to me, this notion of both individual and collective loss was very important to capture in the memorial. And I could not have imagined that we would have the opportunity to do that in the design of the water feature, but it was an idea that was there from the beginning and we were able to find a, a means to express it as we developed the design further. Uh, the name panels uh, with bronze letters uh, sitting behind that, located behind that water feature were what we had imagined. <clears throat> and the design had developed fairly um, far along, as you could see here, when uh, about a year into the process or a year and a half, um, for a variety of reasons, having to do with security, having to do with budget and having to do with uh, design pressures from other projects on site, including the museum, uh, these memorial galleries were eliminated. And we were told that we had to bring the names up to plaza level. And that was a, a very difficult uh, moment for me. I'd always, I had always imagined these memorial galleries as a secular yet spiritual place. And this cover of the daily news uh, where you see a firefighter kneeling in prayer in contemplation um, at one of the temporary pools that were built on site every year to commemorate that day uh, captured for me the, the mood that I had hoped uh, we would be able to create in these memorial galleries. And so when that, we were asked to essentially close them out and bring the names up, I was incredibly, um, apprehensive about how we would address that and could we address it. And here you see me standing one of the mock-ups we had at the Brooklyn Navy Yard where we started to develop alternatives, different ways of doing this. And one idea was that the plaza would end and the water uh, feature would begin and it would then cascade down. And the only thing that would break the surface of that water uh, would be uh, the letters marking the names. And as you can see, the water starts with a shallow step that then becomes deeper as a way of addressing the requirement for a guardrail uh, in front of the 30 foot drop. Um, and we developed this for a good year and felt that it really uh, worked well and beautifully with the design of the plaza overall and the voids. Um, but, uh, we were told to go back to square one yet again when somebody expressed concern that it would not meet code and would be classified by the Department of Buildings in New York as a swimming pool and would require a five foot fence in front of it and a lifeguard. And so we had to bring this up and out of the plaza to a height of 42 inches to comply with our building code. And so uh, here is another version that we developed then. This was still gonna be in bronze. Uh, with that sort of dark brown patina, that sort of statuary bronze with the names uh, raised. And I imagined the top of this element actually being uh, where the water would come from. And it would have tiny little rivulets, sort of almost like tears running across the names in one direction and a torrent of water in the other direction, something that sort of whispered in one direction and roared in the other. Um, and I thought that, you know, this was the right direction, but we were sent back to the drawing board yet again. And each time you can imagine the difficulty and frustration involved in, in developing something and seeing it to what you think is completion only to be told that you have to start yet again. But I do think that each iteration that we went through and there were multiple variations of what you've seen on the way here, uh, informed and contributed to um, how the memorial developed. And what we ended up with is um, an eight foot wide water table that is two foot tall. And then sort of floating above that is this bronze wing that rises to that height of 42 inches. Um, and names are inscribed in the, these uh, thick bronze panels. They're actually uh, cut out of the panel. It's really about the absence of that material forming a shadow during the day where the names are. And at night, these panels are illuminated from within and the names appear as, as light. Um, speaking of the names, I would say if there was one thing that was the most challenging emotionally for everyone involved, uh, it was the arrangement of the names. Um, the family members, um, 
I should start by saying that when we began the process, um, I had suggested something called meaningful adjacency, where there would be a reason why one name is next to another and that um, familial relationships, friendships, work relationships could be reflected in the location of one name next to another. And that we would reach out to family members and ask them what other names of victims of this attack would you like to see next to the name of the person that you lost? And uh, when I proposed this in early 2004 to the LMDC, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, it came on the heels of two years of uh, acrimony between various family member groups, and there were dozens of them, and the LMDC. And so here I am telling the LM LMDC, let's reach out to each and every family member. And they said, you know, this is going to be impossible to implement. Uh, you have to come up with a different idea. And I, I could not really think of any other equitable way of um, of dispersing the names of the victims on the memorial that would not inadvertently create adjacencies that were meaningful to some and not to others. So even something as simple as an alphabetical listing would bring together some couples and separate others. Um, it would um, also not necessarily delineate one person versus another. Clearly, there are you know, three Michael Lynch's on this memorial. And if we were to resort to nothing but an alphabetical listing, how would you know which marker represents which person? Um, and so I suggested in the absence of any other solution that we would just let the names fall where they may by chance. Um, and it was a very painful suggestion to make because I knew that it would separate names which should be together. But if it was painful for me to make that suggestion, you can imagine how it was received by some family members. And for two years, uh, fundraising for the memorial came to a complete halt and uh, various family groups came together with a proposal which would list people on the memorial by the company that they worked for. The companies would be listed alphabetically as would be the people. It would include their age and the floor that they were on and any rank they might have if they were first responders working for the fire department or the police department or other responding agencies. Um, I was not happy with this proposal because I felt that instead of um, focusing on both the individual and the collective, it actually started to group people in a way that was antithetical to, to that, uh, to the spirit of the memorial. And so even if you look at it graphically, the idea of putting names in columns versus letting each name be an island onto itself changed how uh, your reading might be. When Mayor Bloomberg became a chairman of the Memorial Foundation, I met with him again and uh, to discuss what we could do about this. And um, the resolution of that was to arrange the names into nine broad categories, which reflected where people were that day, the, the four flights, the two towers, the Pentagon, as well as um, the 93 bombing victims. But within these groups, uh, based on geography, the mayor was open to the idea of uh, meaningful adjacency. And so in June, um, I believe it was in June, uh, no, in May, um, these name verification kits went out to the family members and we received um, over 1200 requests. And uh, it was sort of, well, we knew that each request that we could meet was meaningful, but we did not know how many of them we would be able to request. And we spent a year uh, on this task, in particular, one woman at our office, um, Amanda Sachs, arranged and rearranged and rearranged the names in order to try and meet as many of these adjacency requests as we could. And even when no adjacency request was made, we tried to group people together by who they might have been with that day. And this was an, an enormous and difficult labor of love, uh, very uh, emotionally challenging uh, one. And when we were able to complete it at the end of the day and meet each and every adjacency, it felt uh, both uh, gratifying and providential and, um, and very meaningful. And for most people who come to the memorial, these connections are invisible, but for family members who come here, I think it's very important. And so one example 
is a request that we got from the family of uh, a young woman who lost her father that day, but she also lost her best friend from college. Her father was on Flight 11 and her friend was working for Aeon at the North Tower. And Flight 11 actually crashed into uh, the North Tower. So her father's name is one of the last names under Flight 11 and her friend's name is one of the first names under um, World Trade Center. Um, and when that family visits the memorial, it's very meaningful for them to see those names side by side. But when I share that story with you, I think it changes your understanding of what happened that day. Uh, it's a way to fight the abstraction of saying close to 3000, when instead you're focusing on one story at a time. And um, the Memorial Foundation has worked with a group called StoryCorps. They record oral histories. And some of those histories, um, you can listen to them when you visit the memorial. So each panel of names has a number associated with it. Here you can see on the screen, for example, S64, South Pool Panel 64. And um, as a visitor, you can come and listen to a story told by, by a friend or a relative um, about a name that you're seeing there on the memorial. So in addition to trying to meet all of the adjacency requests, we also had to make sure that graphically there was a consistency to the way the names wrapped around the pool that we didn't have any unintentional gaps. And so there's quite a lot of work to it. We thought we were in the home stretch when the mayor's office of people with disabilities approached us and told us that if you were seated in a wheelchair, you weren't able to see the void at the center of each pool. And they thought it was equally important to the experience of seeing and touching the names, which you could accomplish in a wheelchair. Now, the eye level of a fifth percentile woman sitting in a wheelchair is just over 42 inches. I think it's 42.3. And so that we did not have really any wiggle room here. We had to create a barrier at 42 inches uh, for safety. Yet we had to contend with that uh, eye level that was not able to capture uh, the central void at the, each pool. And so we tried to create openings in the panels, but none of them felt like they were correct for the language of the memorial. And then we thought, what if we chamfered the corner of the pool? And here you see that center void depicted in blue tape on the carpet floor. Um, and we thought that would allow you to sort of bring that line of sight closer to the edge of the weir, which was really the sort of cutting off the view and then, you know, a few days after we suggested this, we realized um, that the towers actually had chamfered corners. And so we looked at those again and tried to replicate the proportional relationship between the chamfered corner and the long side of each pool and went back to the MOPD, very proud with our solution. And they said, you know, not everybody can turn their head 90 degrees while they're seated in a wheelchair to see that void. And so I wanted to pull every last hair out of my head at that point. But then we thought, you know, we cut it in plan. Let's also cut it in sections. So instead of that wall coming straight down, these corners kind of jut out almost like the prow of a ship. And I think sculpturally, they're more beautiful. Um, instead of stopping and starting the names at the corner, we now wrap them from five rows to three rows and back to five, which poetically, the sort of circle of names that's unbroken is much more successful than what we had before. But I can't say that we welcomed that request when we first got it, but the project did uh, get better for it. In no small part, because we were given the time, despite all the pressure to to respond thoughtfully to it because in the immediate aftermath of that request, uh, a lot of bad suggestions were made by people involved. Uh, you know, a uh, portion of the plaza that could go up or down on a scissor lift or substituting bronze for glass in some areas, et cetera. The memorial opened on the 10th anniversary of the attack and it was an incredibly um, powerful day to come and see the public, the families, the friends um, on this, site for the first time. Um, what looks like, you know, a plaza at grade, you know, is actually a green roof above a very complicated network of public transportation. There's a subway line running underneath Granite Street, a train that runs to New Jersey, a uh, retail concourse, a museum, a chiller plant that serves the five towers. Uh, but all of that complexity is intentionally suppressed and hidden. And we've tried to create a place where you can see the past, see what's no longer here. And um, 
and these are a few images from from that time and uh you know it's as if we had built the stage and then the actors came on it and it just changed you know everything that we did sort of was inanimate and in coming together on the plaza i think they brought this place to life in a way that is so meaningful because it is about being here i think with others and that morning we saw these two girls running around you know and we also saw this man um finding the name of his son and the the fact that these two things can coexist with each other and enrich each other is so meaningful to me and normally I would stop this presentation here, but a couple of years ago, we were uh, asked to come back and respond to an unmet need on the site, something that we had failed to anticipate. And uh, the more we learned about it, the worse I felt about the submission and we were given the opportunity to redress it. And that was uh, the, the enormous number of people that have died since 9-11 of 9-11 related illnesses. Here you see a photo of the recovery effort in the immediate aftermath of the attack. And the people who spent months here um, have developed so many sicknesses. Um, over a thousand of them have died since 9-11. Uh, and it is anticipated that there will be more people that will have died of 9-11 illnesses uh, after the attack than during the attack. And they felt uh, invisible and marginalized and that their story was not told in any way on the plaza and that their deaths were um, suffered alone with family uh, over a period of years. Um, so we created uh, what we're calling the Memorial Glade, and it's meant to honor everybody, uh, whether it was those recovery workers or the people who lived in lower Manhattan. Uh, there was a high school nearby that uh, the kids there have already uh, developed a cluster of cancers, which is directly attributable to, to what happened. I think, you know, lower Manhattan opened uh, a week after the attacks um, and, you know, in retrospect, it was probably not the right move. Um, so the first question we had is how do we add to this memorial and where do we add to this memorial? Uh, we do not have a, a, definit a definitive list of names. Uh, that list is growing. Um, so it would have to be very different than what we have done at the pools and sort of alighted on the memorial glade that existed already at the Southwest portion of the Memorial Plaza. Uh, with a notion of connecting it to the rest of the plaza um, and answering that sort of uh, desire line of walking from the southwest towards the northeast. Uh, this was that area prior to, you know, after the design was completed and before we began our work on the Memorial Glade. And you could see that while the rest of the memorial is teeming with people, this area is completely empty. Um, in part because people were told they couldn't use it. And really only once a year on the anniversary of the attack, after the names were read, the salon was open to the family members and to the public. And it for that one day a year, it was an incredible experience to be there, but it really felt like we should find a way to bring it into the daily life of the memorial. And so here is that area uh, demarcated. And we tried to figure out how we could carve a path through here. The memorial, as I said earlier, is very much characterized by this sort of flat plane. And so we wanted to disrupt it, find a, a way of, uh, of working with it and against it. Um, and sort of like the way that these rocks are sort of thrusting up, uh, we started to imagine some elements would come out of the plaza, sort of pointing up towards the sky, elements sort of, of uh, uplift and resilience and strength, but also reflecting on the, turmoil that was here. So we began to draw these and then we mocked them up and tried to understand how we would weave them in, which areas of lawn we would cover with paving, where these elements might end up, how we could make them look sort of rough and broken but strong, and um, proceeded with this design. Uh, they are man-made, despite the fact that they look natural. We worked with artisans up in Vermont at Rock of Ages to fabricate them. Um, and then we, you can see the process where that they're flaming the surface, which kind of pops it. 
And then uh, we were able to use steel, which was salvaged from the World Trade Center to create these metal elements. Um, they kind of bind the stone together, almost like sinews. Uh, a little bit inspired by the idea of kintsugi, of mending broken things with precious metal. And so you can see the path as it is today. Uh, it's a remarkable day, uh, May 30th is the anniversary of the recovery completion and it's a day that's marked every year and um, it was very moving to to see that this year and to see people touching uh, the stone touching the steel and and feeling that uh, there is a place on the memorial plaza that acknowledges their their sacrifices in a very different vein and I I think we, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'll, I'll speed up. I, I'll talk very briefly about a memorial I'm designing in Charleston at the Mother Emanuel Church where the horrific shooting happened in 2015. Um, the church is located next to Marion Square. Um, it is, um, we were approached to and uh, asked to to contribute to design. And what was remarkable to me was how, you know, you can see the church in the immediate aftermath of the attack. Everybody came to that space to leave flowers at the sidewalk there, but there was no there there, so to speak, for the memorial. Where would you actually put a memorial? Initially, I was drawn to this little alcove, but it felt too small. And although it was sheltered, it was not of a scale that could support a real memorial. And the so before we could even begin designing a memorial, we had to figure out where it would be. And the church um, agreed to this idea of taking over these, the parking lot that's directly adjacent to the church and uh, rethinking the entire church grounds. So if this is what the church grounds look like today, we thought, could we create a, a wall which would surround and frame these church grounds on three sides? Um, the rear and the east and west while keeping it open on to uh, the front. And so you see the existing condition on the left and the proposed condition on the right, which creates a memorial courtyard to the left of the church and a survivor's garden to the right of the church. Um, you know, this is the Calhoun statue, which towered over Marion Square until the beginning of this year when it came down, which was a remarkable thing. But when we began, were dealing with this, uh, we thought about representation and how do we represent the victims? This is a statue of Denmark Vesey who led the slave revolts in uh, Charleston um, and was killed for his actions. Um, and his statue is far, far from Marion Square in a, in a much more marginal spot. But we thought, how do we, do we represent the victims? Um, in a way that identifies them as African-American, as a way to acknowledge uh, the hatred that was, that motivated this attack. And that idea was um, shared with the congregation and eventually um, we decided to go in another direction because it felt that what happened here was sort of even bigger than the nine, it was the entire congregation. And to them, the message, of love and forgiveness was more important than the individual loss. And they thought that that is what had to, to be conveyed. So we went back to the drawing board with explored many different ideas and ended up with an idea that was really based in some ways on the notion of trying to create a congregational space. Uh, because I think it is that that support, that sense of community that held that congregation together, that held these families together. And we ended up with a design that creates almost a, an outdoor analog to the sanctuary that's next to it, um, creating a, a fountain at the center of the space uh, with these two big fellowship benches, which kind of create some shelter and allow for people to sit together as they look at that um, element. So it was really about creating a, a place for gathering. And um, I am gonna just rush through these because I do wanna leave time for questions. So here you see the early development of the Memorial Courtyard. 
with that fountain uh, in the middle of it where the names will be inscribed. Um, in the corner, a place that we're calling the contemplation basin, which is meant to sort of answer another need for private and quiet contemplation away from a group if you want to, to, to sit alone in prayer. And then on the other side of the church, a much more sort of active and lively space that we're calling the survivor's garden marked by five live oak trees for the five survivors, a place where you can imagine groups gathering for things such as um, classes and seminars, but also weddings, something that will be part of the day-to-day -day life of the church. Um, I'm just going to run through some of these just to say that we're trying to really work with the vernacular of Charleston, which is an incredibly rich and beautiful um, place in its you know, material and architectural expression, but also do something that is very contemporary. So um, how do you do that in a city that like Charleston? And then the very last project that I want to share with you is something that we did uh, last month. Uh, we, um, New York Magazine reached out to us uh, to propose a, a temporary COVID memorial. And we were drawn to mark, uh, you know, one year into this pandemic. Um, here in New York, March really feels in some ways like the beginning of it. Um, and I was drawn to, yeah, I could pick any site, uh, I was drawn to the reservoir at Central Park and imagine, and here's an old print that shows actually what used to be a waterworks with a dam running down the center of it that allowed them to drain one side or another uh, that becomes visible very rarely when the level of the water comes down. And we imagined, what if you could intentionally uh, drain that reservoir to allow that path to emerge from the water and then build uh, almost uh, an aisle of remembrance in the middle of that reservoir? And so here are a few renderings of that idea, uh, utilizing the decommissioned gatehouse is one of them is on the left of this image here, creating a ramp that would bring you down to that submerged wall and would bring you out to this island in the middle of the city, a place where you can be both in the middle and of it all and far away from it all simultaneously and intentionally open-ended to allow for different groups to congregate for different rituals, whether it's a friends gathering to remember a lost friend over a bottle of wine or something much more sort of a, a, a service that's being led for prayer. Uh, we wanted to imagine something that would accommodate different New Yorkers needs at different times. So I, I'll just end with this and say that I think public space is important because of its ability to bring people together and that ability creates uh, a shared sense of identity, which I think is incredibly important. So thank you. Really, really powerful. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think the poetry in the way you describe all of this weaves it together just so beautifully. And, uh, and also your personal reflections I know are so deep to you and meaningful to you. And uh, you know, we certainly appreciate you sharing all of that with us. Uh, let me start with the first question. Um, what I'm, what I heard from you as you described um, these various projects that you're working on, was a little bit again and again um, how you sort of have two approaches. One is sort of commemorating the loss, but the other is enabling the life after the loss. And maybe just a minute on why that is so important to you. You know. Memorials are for the living, right? I mean, we honor the dead, but they are meant to serve the people that visit them. And I think um, in New York, for example, you know, the people who perished here were people who went to their office that day. And I would love, I think it's important that when you visit this memorial, and maybe it's that once in a lifetime pilgrimage, you see people who live here, who work here, on that memorial too, that it's part of your experience of being here, that um, that we live with this past, that we don't just visit it once and 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 move on, uh, but that it's part of our daily life. And I know that uh, the same is true in, in Charleston. That congregation uh, 
is strong and survives, but it's not because they've moved past the past. It's because it's part of their day to day. We have a couple of questions. If we can just go back to sort of the beginning of the uh, of the September 11th memorial. Um, just a couple of questions coming in from our viewers about the competition. Were the eight finalists all anonymous, or did you eventually find out about the other participants? Yeah, eventually I did. In the first stage of that, they actually brought us in two groups of four to see the site so that we wouldn't know everyone, but I, I don't think they really could have brought us in one by one. I do remember um, at the end of the process after the uh, this design was selected the other finalists actually invited uh, we had one big dinner with everyone there uh, which was really remarkable and a uh, beautiful gesture uh, that somebody else organized and i felt a little bit like i was in the hot seat during the dinner but uh <laughs> but it was very generous and um and um you know it, it was more than i think the eight finalists it was you know, the fact that so many people wanted to participate in this process, I think it was a way for for thousands to to express their grief. And because when you participate in a competition like this, I, I don't think anybody does that with the belief that they're going to, you know, win a commission. I think you do it for other reasons. You do it because it's a cathartic to, to you and it's and it's a way of, you know, if I was a poet, maybe I'd write something. If I was a painter, I'd paint something. But for me, like finding a, a way of expressing myself through my work is, is very important. And as architects, we usually deal with such tangible things, right? How many square feet are in this apartment? And, you know, how much, how big is this window? And how expensive is that door? And here, um, it's an entirely different world. It's still part of our process of design but you get to um you're not delivering anything um tangible uh, you know rent per square foot you're you're trying to create something that is that has an emotional impact that people can relate to and i think that it's a privilege to to work in that realm sometimes it's uh so let me ask you a question do you, do you think um the fact that there were 5,201 entries into this competition, um, and you know the space in which you work, uh, you know, the, the international architecture space, what, what does that say? What, what did that say to you that there were 5,200 entries? I think there was um, a moment that we all came together and that to me is a reflection of that. And I think we're seeing ourselves in an increasingly um, politicized and polarized world that, um, that where we don't have a shared sense of identity. And so I think uh, it's, a, you know, it's a moment in time where I think we all were united and um, Sometimes it takes tra tremendous tragedy to do that. Um. The, um, so another question about just just the sheer immensity of the project. Um, you know, for me, I'm always gratified when we have a big public project and we're willing to make the investment to make sure it's right. And I think most of us would say, whatever it costs, this was right. Um, but one of the questions from our audience is, how much did it cost to build and how much of it came from the private sector and was Mayor Bloomberg's or private citizen yeah. Bloomberg supportive of it in any of this? Yeah. So um, I think there were it's probably been some forensic analysis of the finances of what went on there. The complexity of what was going on there is that, for example, the, the floor that you stand on when you're on the, the paving material that you stand on is also the roof for uh, the Port Authority's um, concourse below it. And so there is a lot of, um, you know, 
disagreement over how those costs should be allocated by different parties. And so uh, the Port Authority represented its interests. Um, the private developers that had to rebuild towers here represented theirs, the MTA. So um, I've heard, you know, estimates that this was, you know, upwards of, you know, 750 million for the memorial, but uh, I also heard numbers that it would have been 500 million just to sort of fill in that bathtub and bring it to grade. Uh, so uh, I don't feel like I can give a, a, a number that is not disputable <laughs> on this right. front. Um, other projects, you know, for example, we're fundraising now for the Manual Nine Memorial, and I hope. Uh, the audience today will look at the website for that memorial, emmanuel9.org, and contribute there. And I'm hoping that we will be able to begin construction on that very soon. But um, here in New York, it was a combination of uh, a lot of private donations. And Mayor Bloomberg was very uh, instrumental in both donating uh, money and uh, his leadership and also wrangling many other groups here in New York to contribute to the memorial. Um, you know, I was telling you earlier that we moved to New York, my family in uh, 14 or 15 years ago in 2007. And, you know, we'd experienced the loss of September 11th in Washington. And of course, we all experience the loss of what happened in New York, but you know, it felt like getting to the next step was this journey that may not ever end, right? And I think everybody wanted the site to be at its tomorrow, right? Like, let's leave yesterday, let's yeah. seal up yesterday, um, recover from it, mourn from it, but let's get it to tomorrow. But it seemed to be dragging on and, and, and there were all kinds of uh, controversies and issues that arose and things that had to be worked out. In the meantime, your, your project is beginning to gain steam through all of that. And I'm just curious, uh, did your project then have an impact on some of the later stages of development in the entire Superblock site as you described it? Yeah, and um, you know, I'll just say that when we started this, everybody said it's too soon. We need some distance and time to contemplate this. And then, like, I, I don't know the exact moment in time, but it flipped 180 degrees, and everybody was like, <laughs> "What's taking so long?" Right. So there was no sort of, you know, in the middle. It was either too soon or not fast enough. Um, and you know, the site is nearing completion right now. Um, there's a performing arts center building that is uh, under construction, will probably open next year. Um, three of the towers are up, two more are to be built uh, of the five that are envisioned for the World Trade Center site. Um, but it was incredibly important for us to open the memorial on the 10th anniversary of the attack to mark that moment with a, an appropriate response. And um, as a result of that, when the memorial opened, the surrounding streets and sidewalks weren't complete yet. And so there was a construction fence around us. Um, the Port Authority argued that they had to build our uh, supports before they would have normally built them in a normal sequence of construction. So they had to kind of build from the top down rather than from the bottom up for the spaces that they were doing below the memorial. Um, and to enter the memorial and that when it first opened, you had to book tickets, you had to go through security screening, you had to go through these fences and through a gate. So it, was, um, so it didn't have that sense of a public space. Um, but then one day without any sort of fanfare, uh, construction fence at the southwest cor southeast corner of the memorial just disappeared. And all of a sudden anybody could just walk off the street and onto the memorial plaza. And my office is actually just two blocks away from here. And I just ran out and I started to take pictures of <laughs> strangers just walking onto the plaza. And it, it was such a, uh, a, uh, a meaningful moment to me to see it begin to weave itself into the fabric of the city. Uh, there were so many naysayers that said, oh, you'll never, it will never be open the way you're envisioning it. It will always have fences around it. And um, 
they're, you know, with COVID now here, they have kind of put a chain around it and they only open it up at noon, but, you know, I'm sure that we will return to, to normalcy soon. Um, but if you don't build in the ability for these places to be part of the city, to be at great, to meet the surrounding streets and sidewalks, to weave themselves into their urban fabric, they never will. I mean, you, things can always be closed off, but it's much harder to, to, to build something that can be connected. Well, as our last question, I hope I'm not gonna embarrass you by this, but I'm gonna give it to you. It's from one of our members who always poses great questions in our, uh, when we have visitors. They say, when you win a Pulitzer, you know the first line of your obituary. <laughs> what do you think yours would be? <laughs> uh, um, you know, well, uh, hopefully I won't find out for a long time. <laughs> there you go. You know, um, I, this is an incredible achievement for, uh, and I'm very proud of it and, and humbled by it. And I, I, I but then something along else comes along, like the work I'm doing in Charleston, and it is so meaningful to me. And um, you, you know, as important as the work that I did here is to me, it is in the rearview mirror now. And I'm focused on the the next project and how it can have an impact. And it will be different, um, but my hope is that it will be meaningful. And I'm sure it will be. I, I'm going to say that I think maybe the last line might be hopefully decades, if not hundreds of years from now when it's finally written, but uh, perhaps uh, he cared enough to make a difference and he did. I wanna thank you so much for joining us. I hope we have you back to talk about something, uh, some of your other work at some point in the future. It's really been an outstanding evening and I think we're gonna get all kinds of great comments and people are gonna be wishing they could go out to dinner with you. And maybe next time you'll be here and we will go out to dinner afterwards. I wanna uh, just really thank you for taking the time to be with us. I also wanna thank our Muscarelli Studios team of Laura Fogarty and Lauren Green for producing tonight's program. And of course, I wanna thank all of you for joining in on this journey through a very important time in all of our lives. Thank you all. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great evening.